Hi, it's Dwyer. RichardDwyer.com, GamblersAdvisory.com, as well as KeepingItFree.blogspot.com. Today is Wednesday, August the 28th, 2019. Let's discuss convicted murderer Wayne Williams' link to Nathaniel Cater's murder. Right? Understand. At least 30 African Americans were murdered, police believe, by Wayne Williams in the early 1980s. But of all the murders, prosecutors only chose to charge him with two murders. They thought these two cases were the strongest cases. Jimmy Ray Payne, who we're not going to discuss in this video, we might address him in a later video, and Nathaniel Cater, whose body Wayne Williams is supposed to have thrown off a bridge at 3 in the morning on May the 21st, 1981. Right? A police recruit. I'm not kidding. Heard a splash. That led to Williams's arrest. We'll talk about that. And eventual conviction. Now, let me just say, I was raised in a black community in Queens, New York City, and I can just tell you unequivocally that very few people in Cambria Heights, Queens, in the early 1980s, believed that Wayne Williams was the Atlanta child murderer. Right? The consensus, and it's hinted at in Mindhunter on Netflix, I completely recommend season two, which is fantastic. They talk about Wayne Williams. Right? It's hinted at in the Mindhunter series. I'm just telling you many people, not only in my community, but my mother, for example, felt that the Klan had to be behind these murders. That someone couldn't be from the black community and be out systematically killing black children. Right? Let me point out, too, that Mindhunter which talks about profiling, the profile at the time developed by profiler John Douglas, which predicted that the killer would be black. In Mindhunter, you get the feeling that they're still developing profiling as a discipline in the early 1980s. Right? There was a lot they didn't know. There's even a moment in the show where they come across a black serial killer and they're amazed. They hadn't studied that many of them. Now let me say this, and I'll say it clearly, let's acknowledge it up front. Right, according to recent DNA testing, in other words, DNA testing done in the last 10 years, Wayne Williams is clearly not completely innocent. Right, Patrick Baltazar, that's the victim. Has two human hairs in his pocket that they did DNA testing on. What they found is that only two and a half out of every 100 Americans has the gene sequence that's on those hairs. Wayne Williams is included in that 2.5% that has the gene sequence. But understand how inexact that is. Right? They're telling you that there's a possibility that Wayne Williams is innocent. In other words, this is inexact DNA testing. There are DNA cases where they say, you know, there's a one in a billion chance that it's someone else. Well, here the number's a lot higher, right? For every <laughs> hundred people, understand, it's not one person who has this DNA sequence. It's two and a half, right? Dog hairs found on Patrick Baltazar show that Wayne Williams' father's dog, Sheba, 
is part of, let's say, 2% of all dogs who have the DNA sequence there. So when you add in the 2.5% for Williams' human DNA with the 2 to 2.5% for Williams' dog's DNA, right? It looks like Williams may have been involved at least in the Patrick Baltazar murder. But what I want people to realize is that Williams was never tried or convicted for the Patrick Baltazar murder. No, he's in prison for murdering Payne and Nathaniel Cater. Let's focus on the evidence against him with regard to Nathaniel Cater. Because I'm just telling you, this is thin. Right? I have problems with it today. Let's talk about the problems. Now there are at least four law enforcement people, not one, four, who are by the bridge that Williams supposedly drives up on, right, opens his car door, gets Nathaniel Cater who, according to the court in Williams versus the state of Georgia, a 1983 case, weighed about 146 pounds. Right? Understand, Williams himself is only 5'7". Nathaniel Cater is actually a bigger man than Wayne Williams. Right? Taller man. Certainly a man with enough weight where it would require some effort to get him out of your car to then throw him off a bridge that has a ledge, right, that has a rail. Well, understand, the police version has Wayne Williams driving this car, there are four cops around, at least, driving this car onto the bridge, getting 140 plus pound Nathaniel Cater, who's supposed to be nude, Right, getting him out of the car, then tossing him over the bridge rail into the river, where Cater's body makes a splash. Now here's the problem with the splash. Four law enforcement people at least. How many hear the splash? only one, a police recruit. Right? Law enforcement, our law enforcement, wants you to believe that the other three guys were either inattentive or were sleeping. Only one of four cops hears the splash. There's no tape recording of the splash. I find that troubling. Well, let me just say this. Williams then gets in his car and is stopped by police. Right? Right by the bridge. The police ask Williams for permission to search his car. Williams gives them permission. He even goes in a different cop car and sits there and talks with another police officer while they search his car. Now let's be clear here. The police theory is that moments earlier he had a corpse in his car. Right? Moments earlier. Nathaniel Cater's body is found days later nude. So this corpse would have been nude. You would imagine that law enforcement has a certain training where they would be able to smell, let's say, decomposition or death in the car. You would imagine that law enforcement would be able to look in the car and would be able to see blood or any kind of sign of any kind of struggle if the corpse just got killed and there is no 
smell of death or anything like that. Right? Well, understand, the police look through the car. There are no police records of any cop that night seeing any blood anywhere in the car. There are no police records anywhere of anyone smelling decay or the kind of decomposition that would come from a dying body. Understand too, the sound of the splash is all any of the police officers and we know only one police recruit heard the splash. Right? The sound is all they heard. There are no cops who can testify that they even saw Williams outside of the car with a body, a 140 plus pound body. Nobody saw Williams dragging the body to the edge of the bridge on a stakeout. No cops saw Williams throw Cater off the bridge. That's on a stakeout with four different police officers. Three of whom not only saw nothing, but they didn't hear anything. Right? Well, let's just say it gets worse. Right? It gets worse. Let's look at the victimology. Now understand, the police are out looking for the Atlanta child murderer. Right? They're looking for a pedophile. Right? The police to this day and the prosecution from Williams' trial want us to believe that Williams was a pedophile killing kids. Well, understand, Nathaniel Cater, the alleged murder victim here, was 27 years old. Not only was he not a kid, he was four years older than Wayne Williams and was physically bigger. So understand, the FBI profile that's focused, excuse me, that's highlighted on Manhunter, Right, John Douglas's FBI profile of the killer doesn't fit this crime, does it? Because this crime is the murder of a 27 year old, not a child. Right, understand too, Cater is several inches taller than Wayne Williams. Cater didn't look like a child. Right, Cater's a guy with facial hair. Well, there's even a bigger problem. Let's just use common sense. We don't have to be profilers here. We don't have to be experts here. Let's just use common sense. Nathaniel Cater had friends. Right? Now, the splash supposedly takes place at 3 a.m. on May the 21st, 1981. That's when the splash supposedly takes place. That's when the police arrest Wayne Williams. Not arrest him, detain him, look in his car. Right? By the way, Nobody bags any evidence from his car that night. Wayne Williams is allowed to leave, to go home. The police don't have enough that night. Right? There's a claim out there that Wayne Williams had a rope in his car. Not only was that rope not bagged by police as evidence, it wasn't kept by police as evidence. Folks, it wasn't even photographed by police. 
So police really today don't have proof of what was in Wayne Williams' car that night. But the one thing we know with certainty is that they let Wayne Williams go home. Well, would it surprise you to know that some of Nathaniel Cater's friends saw Mr. Cater later? After the May 21st 3 a.m. splash? Did you know that these are friends who knew Cater? In other words, this isn't the stranger who sees someone who might look like some police flyer. No, no. One guy described himself as a running buddy of Cater's. Let's name him. Howard Campbell. Right? He said he was a running buddy of Cater's. He sees Cater two days later, May the 23rd, 1981, at 2.30 p.m. Understand, a second guy, Jimmy Tightrope Williams, sees Cater walking into a building earlier that day. This is two days after police hear the splash. Right? Understand the fact that both of these guys knew Cater, had seen him several times before they saw him on May the 23rd, greatly reduces the chances of mistaken identity. So one wonders what's going on here. Right? The evidence is so thin. Even after the splash that the police let Wayne Williams go home. Right? There are people who see Cater, who know Cater, who see him after the splash. You heard me talk about how advancements in DNA testing have allowed them to reach the conclusion that with regard to the Patrick Baltazar murder, Wayne Williams is in the two and a half percent of Americans who could have done that murder. Right? Two and a half percent. But yet, even after all the advancements in DNA, there's no DNA linking Williams to Nathaniel Cater's murder. Right? None. So what I want to do, because I want to be as fair as possible, is I'm going to read from the 1983 case of Williams versus the state of Georgia, right, where the court summarizes the fiber evidence against Williams. What I want you to do is to pay close attention because understand, this supposedly is some of the best evidence they have against Williams with regard to all of the alleged murder victims. Right? When I say alleged murder victims, don't get me wrong. They're murder victims. I say alleged because the question is whether Wayne Williams was the person who murdered them. I don't mean to belittle the fact that 30 people lost their lives. What I'm openly questioning here is the identity of the person who did it. Right? So we're just focusing on Cater here because Wayne Williams was convicted of murder for allegedly killing this guy. So one would expect, since there's no DNA evidence, since there are people who saw Cater after he's supposed to have been thrown in the river, right? His body washes up days later. So this fiber evidence has to be airtight, doesn't it? The color of the fiber has to match up. We should be able to look at this fiber. Right? We should be able to look at this dog here evidence. And we should be able to say, okay, this is sufficient to remove all doubt as to Wayne Williams' culpability, responsibility for this murder. Right? Does it get more serious than murder in criminal court? 
So, according to the court, this is the evidence they have with regard to Wayne Williams' responsibility for Nathaniel Cater's murder. According to the court, Cater's body was nude. Therefore, only his pubic and head hair regions were capable of holding fiber or hair evidence. Even so, several fibers and hairs were recovered. Larry Peterson testified, one, this is as written, right? One, that two pale violet acetate fibers removed from the head hair of Cater had the same characteristics as the violet acetate fiber present in Williams's bedspread except that they were lighter in color. Two, that a green nylon fiber removed from Cater's head hair had similar characteristics and properties as the fibers which composed the carpet in Appellant's bedroom except that it was lighter in color. Three, that a green polypropylene fiber taken from Cater's pubic hair had the same microscopic and optical characteristics as the fibers which composed the carpet in the workroom in the Williams home. Four, that a melted nylon fiber removed from Cater's head hair was consistent with nylon fibers found in the fibrous debris vacuumed from Appellant's 1970 station wagon. Five, that a yellow rayon fiber removed from Cater's hair was consistent with the properties of the fibers present in the yellow blanket found in Appellant's bedroom, except that it was lighter in color. And six, that four animal hairs recovered from Cater were consistent with the characteristics of the hair of Williams's dog. There was evidence that the fibers found on Cater which were lighter in color than their supposed counterparts in the Williams environment were lighter because of their exposure to river water. So based on this Right, Williams is convicted of Cater's murder. Folks, many of the fibers were lighter in color. Understand, there's no one who saw Cater at Williams' house. You have dog hairs here. But yet for these dog hairs, unlike the Baltazar case, there's no DNA, right? There's no DNA linking the Williams family dog to this Cater murder. In other words, this evidence is thin, right? It's thin. The prosecution did have someone who didn't know Williams claim that he saw Williams and Cater together leaving a theater. But yet there's nobody in the theater who can confirm that sighting. Right? One would imagine these men, if they were in a theater watching a movie, right, in a business, walking in, Wayne Williams had a distinctive look in the early 1980s. One would assume there'd be other witnesses who saw these two men together. Let's go one step further. The sighting doesn't conform to the FBI profile. Right? Williams is a guy who actually had a girlfriend testify at trial. Williams, if he is gay, was very much in the closet. The alleged witness who claims that he saw Cater and Williams together claims that they were holding hands out in public. Right now, if you are to believe that Williams 
is privately luring kids, you know, and is uh, abusing children and stuff like that. Uh, Williams is very much in the closet. This is a guy who wanted to portray himself as straight. Am I supposed to believe that he's in a city and he's holding another man's hand? By the way, as I said, Cater has friends. None of Cater's friends remember Wayne Williams. So this evidence is thin. And you mean to tell me that out of two and a half dozen murders, the police felt that this was one of the murders that had the most evidence to bring before a jury? Let me go one step further. Apparently there was a big moment at Williams' trial. John Douglas, in one of the great moments for criminal profiling, advised the prosecution that Wayne Williams was someone who, when challenged, would crack under pressure, would lose his temper, would show his temper to the jury. So apparently there's a moment at the trial where they keep questioning Wayne Williams, and Williams cracks. He says, you want to see the real Wayne Williams? I'll show you the real Wayne Williams, and he is agitated right from the witness stand. Apparently that shook up the jury a bit. It showed Williams as having a temper. But doesn't that run counter here? <laughs> doesn't it run counter to the profile here? Aren't we really talking about a structured, organized killer who is out hunting prey, who is using an alleged music career to lure young people, 11 to 20, who want to be successful in music, who view him as a talent scout, who view him as a possible Barry Gordy, right, the head of Motown, as a possible star maker, right? Isn't this someone using a ruse to lure young people in, not 27-year-olds like Cater, Right to lure young people in and then to isolate the young person before killing them and either putting their body in the woods someplace, uh, by dumpsters, or in the river. Right? Where does his temper supposedly take over? I thought the thrill that Williams is supposed to have gotten Right? And keep in mind, apparently he's not having sex with the kids. He's just killing the kids. But the argument is, just like with BTK, that you could get sexually aroused and sexually gratified from murdering your victim. Right? But just understand, anger doesn't really play a role in what Williams is doing. Isn't it supposed to be sexual gratification? Right? It's not like Williams is with someone on a date, then loses it and kills them. Right? Isn't this different? Isn't this the person who gets the thrill from killing the person? Who isn't relying on the emotional room temperature before making the decision to kill them? So if a jury saw Wayne Williams supposedly lose his temper during the trial and then they decided to convict him of murder based on this sketchy let's just call it what it is the colors don't even match up sketchy fiber evidence right that doesn't involve a DNA match right that involves a splash that takes place before the alleged murder victim is cited by some friends of his two days later. Right? If a jury decided that Wayne Williams had a temper and so they were going to convict him based on that temper of 
this murder, right? A murder where, supposedly, within minutes of Williams getting the body out of his car, the police actually searched the car with Williams' permission. Under these facts, to me, the jury did all of us a disservice. If it convicted him, based on a temper tantrum during the trial right that's not even the prosecution version of events understand no one no one sees wayne williams looking remotely upset with nathaniel cater right only one person claims to have seen them together and he didn't know wayne williams this isn't as reliable as Nathaniel Cater's own friends seeing him two days later. So forgive me. I'm a skeptic of Williams's murder conviction. Right? How do you reach proof beyond a reasonable doubt? No DNA match. Right? One of four cops, here's the splash. They don't see a body that night. Right? I'm a skeptic of Williams's conviction for the murder of Nathaniel Cater. Right? I, it's, it's atrocious. Let me just point out, too, that the idea of a prosecution then introducing other murders during this Cater trial, for which they had even less evidence than this, to me is just appalling. I don't know how you get to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I'll agree. I myself believe Williams might be liable for the Baltazar murder. But American jurisprudence is supposed to run along certain tracks. You're supposed to be convicted for what you're tried for. Right? There's a presumption of innocence, you know, until the conviction. We can't have situations like this where the evidence is thin. Four cops are by the bridge. No one sees Wayne Williams get out of the car dragging a body. There is no visual on it. We're here left to speculate as to how Wayne Williams, 5'7", gets this 146 pound body over the over the bridge railing I mean folks whether or not you think Williams killed other people in my opinion there just isn't the evidence here that he killed Nathaniel Cater and understand this is one of the two murders that Wayne Williams is convicted of doing. Let me say this too. Wayne Williams apparently was handing out flyers. Right? Trying to invite kids who were 11 to 20 to try to get a record deal. How does this 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater fit into that narrative. Right, folks, he doesn't. I understand Wayne Williams, when he talks with police that night, right, the night one of four cops hears a splash, gives the police questionable information, makes the claim that at three in the morning he was on his way to see some um, wannabe uh, music performer. Okay, fine. Maybe Williams wasn't completely forthright. Right? But the burden's on the prosecution. It's not on Wayne Williams. It's the prosecution's burden to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They were far short here. I'm surprised the jury disregarded or diminished. Didn't give a lot of weight. To the testimony of Nathaniel Cater's own friends who saw him after the splash. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. 
Thanks for stopping by.